or we got more. Hi, everybody in the Second Shift community. I am so excited that Susan McPherson is here. She is uh, the CEO of McPherson Strategies, a brand and social impact marketing firm and communications firm. She's been 25 plus years as an expert in her field. And then she just recently wrote a book called The Lost Art of Connecting, The Gather, Do, Ask Method for Building Meaningful Business Relationships. And Susan's like a force of nature and he has, has been called a super connector, which we'll dive into what that actually means and how one can become one um, shortly. But I just wanted to welcome Susan. This is a terrific opportunity for us to talk about how to get back into the real world and changing our mindset on how we go from being huddled behind our computers to actually going back in life. Um, but I will say now that I'm sitting here huddled at my computer talking to you, it feels weird because we just realized we're actually really close to each other geographically and could have been having this conversation together. But like I said, we're, we're out of that idea that we just do things together. So we just assume we're doing it online and separate. And I hate that. How are we going to, how do we change that? And are we ready to do it? We are so ready. Um, and I have to say, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you to the Se Second Shift community. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. And I'm so happy it's Friday. Um, but interestingly enough, this week, I did a couple of real live book talks on stage. And I have to say, I normally am not terrified, but it felt so weird. You know, like I was kept expecting the screen to come down <laughs> between myself and the audience. But, you know, seeing people coming together um, it gave me a renewed sense of energy and enthusiasm. Um, I launched the book in March and, and there was something very bittersweet about launching a book about connecting during probably the loneliest time in my life and one of the hardest times for so many people. But um, the good news is, is I think we're finally on the upswing. The, the vortex will soon be opening. Um, I'm not saying that though, to put pressure on people because I think we need to go at our own pace no one knows for sure and nobody will know for a while what this pandemic how this pandemic affected us so i think you know don't feel like this if you don't feel it don't rush take your time yeah that's a good that's good advice um and you've you've said that like networking is a necessary evil but it, and it's true and we've i remember doing this webinar like more than a year ago now, talking about how you can use online tools to network because we're all home. And that seems like really important thing, but now we need to remember how to go into like this hybrid situation where, where we're back and, and it is so important to keep up connections and you can't just do that through line and technology does feel a little bit impersonal and transactional. So your book is all about the importance of being in person and creating personal networks and how However, are you doing that how do you yeah it's not just for business but particularly in business with this focus and these the groups that we're in and the community we're in sure well the book was written it's i started to write it in february 2020 obviously the world came crashing down in march of 2020 and for nine months it was written during the pandemic so the book is very much around how to connect during the pandemic. Um, obviously at the time, I didn't know that we would be sitting here 16 or 18 months later, still in some sort of strange um, uh, flat, you know, situation. But, um, but so the book definitely gives lots of tips, both for connecting internal, I mean, connecting online, as well as connecting in person. I think when I was writing it, the hope was, oh, it's just another month. It's just another month. Um, but it, it very, I, I conducted about 35 interviews with leaders who have made connecting integral in their career development. They cited connecting as a reason for their success. And we, during those interviews, delved into how are you staying connected now? Um, and there's a reason I didn't title the book, The Lost Art of Networking. And I, you know, you mentioned networking and I am not anti-networking by any stretch of the imagination, but if you look up the Merriam-Webster dictionary of what networking means, there's a reason work is in there. And it's very transactional and it's one to many. And I wanted to flip that on its head and instead think about deep, meaningful connections. And the underlying theme of the entire book, which I think really weighs heavily on all of us, given everything we've been through, and that is leading with 
how can I be helpful of others? And well, of course, let me ask you, yeah. you, you've been called a super connector. Now yeah. you must be really good at doing, at doing all of the things that you're espousing for everyone to, to, for you to have that moniker and for people to just put that forward about you. So what does that actually mean? And how does one become a super connector so that we can all be called that? Because that seems like a really good thing to be. Well, I mean, some people don't have any desire to be connectors. I, as, from a young child, loved it. And I am the offspring of a, a parents who were serial connectors. And I tell the story in the book is when I was a little girl in upstate New York, um, I grew up north of Albany in the late 60s, early 70s. I'm going to be 57 on Halloween. Um, so Happy birthday. Like, Almost. Thank, you. thank you. I can't believe I'm that age, but it is what it is. Um, but I, uh, every morning at the breakfast table, they would literally have the five local newspapers splayed out yesterday's or the day before is New York Times and Boston Globe, and they would be clipping and cutting and then going to their manual typewriters and writing short little missives to relatives, to friends, to colleagues. My dad was a student, uh, I'm sorry, my dad was a college professor at a women's college for close to 40 years. He would have students, their daughters, and then their granddaughters. He would stay in touch with all of them. So this was my formative years. I assumed everybody did this. So I grew up even in high school. In They're like your own personal LinkedIn. They had, they were before LinkedIn, they were LinkedIn. They were doing it and they, but they were doing it with a real sense of intentionality and personalization, you know? And then when I got my own fax machine in the late eighties, I felt like a kid in the candy store because all of a sudden I could take what they were doing and do it expediently. Of course, I'll be honest with you, Jenny, I have a feeling those faxes never got to who they were supposed to be going to, but that's for another day. And then the internet happened and social media and, and you know, iPhones and everything. But I, it is that intentionality. It is finding out a little bit about the person before you make the introduction so that when you make the introduction, it's all the more special. Right. I like to find the uncommon, I'm sorry, the commonality in the uncommonality, right? Because no matter how different we are, no matter where we're from in the world, we tend, we tend to forget that we actually have more in common than we don't, even in today's horrible vitriol that we're, we're experiencing, certainly on social media. Um, but so for me, it was just normative. And, uh, you know, I always had a job and I always was very involved in social impact. But what gave me joy was making those connections. And finally, in 2007, I went away with seven girlfriends for a retreat in the Catskills. And our goal that weekend was to be able to um, artfully articulate our elevator speeches, you know, our 30 second intros. And it was by Sunday afternoon of that weekend, I got the guts to say, hi, I'm Susan McPherson and I'm a serial connector. And then I went and peed in my pants because it sounded so ridiculous. But it was the first time. And then, of course, 16 years later, here comes the book. So, um, you know, I, I, a lot of the book talks about finding your superpowers. I finally not only had found my superpower, but I got to the point where I was innate. I, I felt empowered because I had my friends around me and people I trusted to actually say it for the first time. I love that. Thank you. So you you see that there's a method behind it and not yeah. just being super connector, but it's the gather, ask and do method. So can you go through each of those sure. points and what Absolutely. is, the, I'd love to know just like, what, what does that mean, gather, ask, do, and, and how do you use it? Sure, sure. Well, and dare I say that, again, this weird time we're in is a, is a really good, healthy time to actually use that methodology um, and use it various times in your life. So the gather section, which is the first third of the book, talks about most importantly connecting with the most important person in your life, and that is yourself. And essentially doing an audit on what are your goals for the next four years, four months, four weeks. And very intentionally thinking about who is it that you want to connect with or reconnect with that are gonna help you meet those goals. But also in the gather section, you think about what I just was saying, and that is what are your superpowers? What are your secret sauces? Because if the underlying theme of the book and the way I have always approached connecting is leading with how can I be helpful? Well, the only way you can be helpful to others is to know how you can be helpful. In other words, what are your, I knew my superpower was making connections. 
But um, I often find sometimes people get stymied in that one area because, and, and this is a generalization, but I tend to be hard on myself. I tend to be, you know, imposter syndrome. And some mornings I wake up and I'm like, I don't have any secret sauces, but we all do. Also in the gather phase, you think about how you're going to do everything possible to break that hermetically sealed bubble that myself included lives in. And that is attracting and, and somehow ending up being around people that look like us, sound like us, the same age as us, the same race as us, the same cultural heritage. So that is the gather section. The ask se section is all about learning to ask the meaningful questions of others so we can find out how we can be helpful. If we ask the meaningful questions, we can find out what are people's hopes and dreams. And when you listen carefully, which I also learned in, in the research for the book, that it's a tough thing to be a good listener, especially after this year and a half of this pandemic, given all the distractions. But if you listen carefully, you can go to the third section, which is my favorite section, and that's the do section. And that's when you take all of the detail, information, hopes and dreams of others and put them in your noggin and start thinking about ways you can help them get there. And before you say, oh my goodness, you know, how do you just go and help everyone? If you go back to the beginning of the gather, you think about strategically connecting and reconnecting with people that are gonna help you meet your goals and vice versa. I'm not suggesting we go and help every single person we meet in life, it's not possible. But I also fervently believe if we help others, the help comes back to us. The karma. Yes. And I will be honest with you, Jenny, I founded my company at age 48. In the eight years, about 95% of the business has been inbound. That tells me that all those connections in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s have come back. And it wasn't like I was sitting there thinking, well, I'm going to have a company someday and I'm going to come calling. That wasn't, I never, I didn't have the dream to be an entrepreneur. In fact, it was the furthest thing from my mind. It's very true. I find that if you help people, if you put yourself out there, if you don't have anything that you're expecting from somebody else, but you're just able to do a favor or make a connection or, you know, like you said, send an article just, just to be helpful, then that just does come around. Even if it's not from that person specifically, it's, it's really the, you know, the universe brings it back to you in other ways. Completely. Completely. And it may not be tomorrow or the next next day or the next week. It could be a year from now. But, but it's, it's not it's not just in business. This is a life I, methodology yes, too. Yes. yes. I mean, the book was written as a business book, but I there is not a work Susan and a home Susan. You're looking at her. And I it was probably the mid 90s when um, you know, we, we first had the internet and we would lug home our very happy heavy laptops. And I'll never forget, you know, plugging them into the wall to send my email, going and doing my dishes, coming back and reading my email with, you know, covered with soap suds. At, it was at that time I realized that that barrier between work and home was gone for good and bad. But I also have realized that it's hard enough being one person. Why would I want to be two people? It's true. And also the barrier between work and home, work and personal Yes. is really blurred as well is that like when you think about the way that we live our lives so much of the personal connect so many of the personal connections and so much of your work network can also be personal as well these days so you you really don't have that divide and it's more about how you operate in life not necessarily how you operate one versus another. And I think that's the interesting part of the like work-life integration idea that's happened where it's, it's not a balance. It's really, this is just your whole person. Absolutely. Oh, you said that so well. Well, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so a lot of us are rusty and out of habit these days where it feels, I don't know. I think when you, when you don't do something for long enough, even the things that brought you joy can feel like a burden or like a hassle. So we've gotten, we've, the fallback has been, well, I'm not going to make that call or I'm not going to go to that breakfast or I'm going to do it on Zoom where it used to be a coffee. How do we like shake ourselves out and force yourself to, to do the thing that maybe feels just like, sure. I have to 
my sweatpants to do this. I mean, <laughs> I put on pants today. I'm not wearing sweatpants on this Zoom. So I just there, wanna... there, there's some still there's fashionable sweatpants, and you know, I have a feeling, um, you know, the waistline is important at this right. time. <laughs> How do we get back out there? How do you put yourself out there in a way that, you know, shakes off the cobwebs and, but also doesn't feel unnatural or like you're jumping in too quickly? Well, I think, I think every single, you know, it's such a personal question, right? It's easy for me. I, I was saying before we jumped on that this week I did three talks in real life and oh my God, there was one morning I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this, you know, but I, I had to, I was contractually obligated. But what I would suggest is set reasonable and realistic goals for yourself, knowing, knowing that it's going to be a little bit harder than it used to be, at least for the interim. Um, you know, one of the, one of the um, tips that I give in the book that actually may work for this very question, and that is, I think of the power of the triumvirate or think of threes and go when you go to an event or, you know, preparing for your day that you're going to connect with three people, learn three things and share three things. And if you spread that over the course of a week, that's much more than you've done, you know, in months over, we've been so isolated. And that's doable, feasible, if you think about that over a few days. Now, the, the way I came up with it was more for, you know, when you go to an event and, you know, meet three people, share three things and learn three things. But I'm thinking you can take that methodology and spread it out over a few days. So that you're not meeting, you know, like doing it all at once and maybe looking ahead, say Monday of the coming week over the next week, you want to reconnect or connect with three people. That's doable and feasible. That's doable. That's right. bite I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Just yeah, setting reasonable goals but, and also recognizing that everybody else is in the same place too. Exactly. That we're all doing it slowly and everyone's getting back into whatever, whether it was traveling for work and, you know, feeling like they're getting their sea legs. So you don't have to pretend like you're not. Well, and this is where I'm like, you know, when people are like, oh, I can't reach out to someone I haven't talked to in years. I'm like, why not? Use, use this damn pandemic. Let's ring it for all it did to us. Let's like use that as an excuse. If you need an excuse to reach out to someone you've lost touch with, the worst that can happen is they can say no, or they can ghost you. And it's horrible, but you know what? You move on. Yeah, that's true. And it's, it's such an interesting time because, you know, 3 million women left the workforce in the last uh, 18 months, which is just a crazy amount. And we're, we're just first figuring out how that's going to affect women, how to get, you know, to the second shift community or people who are looking for jobs who are in between opportunities. And, and it's such a, a churning and choppy moment. So these are really good lessons also in figuring out who do you want to be? What do you want this next phase to look like? If you want to get back into the workforce, are you looking full-time? Are you looking to transition? Uh, you know, gather, ask, do can also be a method for thinking about how you want to live the next phase of your life. I love that. Right? It's not just about making, you know, it, it, it's in transition in any phase. 100%. 100%. But again, I this is this philosophy when you were figuring out how to start your company. Do you think that this informed that when you were? No, not at all. I, I, it no? Was all <laughs> you, just, you just jumped in. No, in fact, my my founder story is an accidental founder story. I was working at a, a boutique consulting firm and the there were so many people, so many consultants leaving the firm that I knew the writing was on the wall. So I, um, two organizations, Girl Rising and Global Citizen Year said, they weren't clients at the time, because of course, you know, I couldn't, I mean, legally, and I, nor would I take existing clients with me, but they said, if you leave, we'll hire you for three or four months as a consultant. So that gave me the kind of confidence to, to make the move, but I was so afraid they were gonna change their mind that I left the firm on a Friday and I started consulting on a Monday never took time off because I was just, you know, I had so much self-doubt. I, I had the bag lady syndrome screaming in my head. And here I am eight, more than eight years later. So, um, <laughs> and I joke, you know, my, my last name is, I named it McPherson Strategies because I figured it was just going to be a fleeting thing. I would have come up with something a bit more creative and it's my ex-husband's name. Good guy, <laughs> but we divorced in 2003. So, you know, I founded the company in 2013. I would have a little more or a little less narcissistic in terms of naming that the company. So I digress, but I wish I had a more, a, you know, elaborate story to tell. 
Um, but I think about it, I was thinking about it in some ways, the founding of the second shift, I think about your gather, ask, do philosophy and, and the, the, the idea of being super intentional and in how you go about figuring out what you're good at and what you're not. And in some ways, that's a little bit of my founder story because we, I was working in television as a journalist and was unhappy and trying to figure out like, well, I have no idea what I'm going to do now. If I don't do this thing that I always thought I was going to do, what do I do and what I'm good at and what's my superpower and trying all different kinds of things on to see if that was like, you know, something I was passionate about, like a hobby kind of thing could be a career. And then realizing that you have to distill it down to what you're actually good at. And I really am good at you know, content, I'm good at the brand piece of it. I'm good at connecting with people. I like, I'm really curious about people's stories and helping people and making an impact and all of those like bedrock foundational pieces. And then it came together in this idea that's become the second shift, but that it wasn't like an immediate idea. It was really like diving into how would this work and asking a million people, would you hire people like this? Do you think that there's a need? You know, does this seem like the right fit? and pulling it all together. And then it culminated in that, in the idea of the second shift, but it took a long time and a lot of like fits and starts and different ideas of things that, you know, well, this'll be fun if I do it, but I don't really like it, I'm not good at it. And you know, well, that'll be fun and I'll try that. No, I don't like that either. Um, and then realizing like, well, I'm actually just good at this. So I'll just do this. You know, I, what I found over at least the, the, the first four or five years was I was very good at identifying what I wasn't good at, better than I was identifying. And that's also throughout, you know, as we age in life. But um, a consultant gave me another, uh, a woman who had been a sustainability consultant for many years, gave me some very powerful advice. And um, I'll share it because I'm sure there, there may be so many consultants um, in the audience. And that was... Um, when we have good times running, you know, a, a service-based business, the tendency is to hoard, meaning, you know, you've got all the money coming in, you, you become like a squirrel and you're just like, okay. And what her notion was, that is when you want to hire. That is when you want to get people doing things that either you don't like doing or you're not successful at doing so that then you can focus on what you're good at. And for me, that was getting out and cultivating business and connecting. So I took a risk. I brought on more people during, you know, the first kind of flush of money coming in. But my my tendency was instead to save for the rainy day. Does that make sense? So yeah, absolutely. Um, and that got, you know, I I started to bring on people who were very good at, for instance, keeping the trains and planes moving on time, which I am not operational at all. I can't even, you know, Excel, I still look at it and I get the hives. I mean, I have to look at Excel and, and manipulate Excel, but no, 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 no. <laughs> so anyhow, thought I'd share that. that. That's a good piece of advice. And I wonder, you know, we get the question all the time about people who are taking career breaks or career transitions or, you know, jumping from the full-time job into the consulting role. And that's a good piece of advice. But I, I'm wondering, do you have advice for people who might be looking to, take that transition or get back into work after a break, something that you think has worked well, or just a, a piece of guidance advice that you think from your, you know, all the research that you've done toward the book or just in life. I mean, put it out there, tell people, share with the people that you know, and don't be afraid to, you know, put it right on your LinkedIn profile, searching for the next thing, right? I think sometimes we're afraid to admit that, but if anything, living in this kind of great resignation, you are, you're popular. This is the thing, right? So to me, you know, when I launched the company, one of the first things I did was I, even though I thought it was going to be a few months, I sent an email to my entire database. Okay. That was a lot of people, even back then. So don't be afraid. Um, I, I, again, I figuring, deciding you want to change careers or return to career. That is something you should be proud of. That shouldn't be something that you should be like, well, I shouldn't tell people. I mean, obviously, if you are employed, you, you, you may want to be cautious because you obviously don't want your employer to find out. But I think, you know, this is where our connections and our relationships can really help. Um, and I, I again, I, you know, I told the story about the business inbound. That is because I, I let people know. You know, we, people can't read our minds. 
I, I often give the piece of advice that um, your own personal networks and connections are the places to go first. So for particularly for people who are looking to transition or to go back to work, go to the people who know you first, because they're going to be willing to take the biggest gamble on you. They know you, they know who you are and what you can do. So why not mind that first and just put it out there and offer your services up and see how you can be helpful. Yes. And then those people will hopefully take, take the opportunity, use you, know you, and then you can build that into something else. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I often, when I'm doing talks and I, I pull the audience and I'll say, how many of you have been um, uh, reached out to on LinkedIn and you answer the call and you connect um, or, you know, you say accept, and then an hour or two goes by and you already have them trying to sell you something. A hundred percent. Yes. And what about if instead somebody connected with you and said, Jenny, I know you're launching or you run this community in this company, Second Shift. I happen to know blah, 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 who might be interested. May I introduce you? And, oh, by the way, I have a bookkeeping service or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, what if they did a little bit of research before and then offered up something? Wouldn't that be so much more appealing? Yes. Right? Yes. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I told this story the week of my book launch in March, which was chaos, as you can imagine. I received a, an, an email from a, a woman who, you know, very lovingly said, you know, she heard me speak a few years ago and that she wanted to reach out because she was launching her company and she wanted to pick my brain. And, you know, I know we all bristle when we hear pick, pick your brain. I always give people the benefit of the doubt because, you know, I didn't get Phoebe, that's my dog. I didn't get to where I was by, you know, people not offering me help and guidance. So, but I just, for the first time in my life, I thought to myself, if she had Googled me that week or, you know, took the time to look at my LinkedIn or my Twitter, she might've been able to know I was in the midst of a book launch. Again, you know, many people write books. I'm not, I'm nothing special, but it would have meant it, 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 if she had said, dear Susan, great news on your book launch. Is there anything I can do to help? And oh, by the way, I would have been so much more likely to jump at that. And again, I'm, I, I want to reiterate, I'm not, I don't expect like anything more than maybe just doing some, some, a little bit of research, but that week of all weeks in my entire professional life. So anyhow, when I, the, the point of the story is when we reach out to others to ask, let's offer something at the same time. It's true to do your research. That's a key. Yeah, and we have it. You know, I, in the 80s, when I was working for USA Today, when I had to research people that I would be interviewing for, you know, the, 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 the articles in the paper, I literally could, would go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and the Yellow Pages. I mean, now you have everything to find out about people. It just takes one extra step. It's just yeah. a tiny little <laughs> extra step that, you know, that, that shows somebody that you've paid attention and that you're actually putting in the effort. And it's not just about them, it's also about you. Yes, it's a relationship that you're hoping to create. I wonder if we have any questions in the audience. I like for people who are listening, I, I think I- Or comments. Comments, I, I think I put, might have done this where I put everybody on mute. So let me just, I don't know if I did, but anyway, <laughs> if anyone wants to ask a question, why don't you put it in the um, in the Q and A, and I'm happy to answer to ask it. Or you know, I think that's the best way to do it anyway, because um, I feel like you have you know such great advice to give, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. But if anyone does have a question, feel free to throw it up there. Um, in the meantime, I'm just wondering what you think of the way that. The, what the great resignation and the job market, even in, from your point of view as a strategist, how are you seeing this play itself out? And people ask me all the time what my best guess on how things are going to go is. And I, you know, it's, it's such an interesting time to be part of this yeah. in the working world. I'm terrified I'm going to lose all my employees, you know, um, Oh, yeah, that's a good <laughs> about that too. I'm like, there's got to be way better opportunities for you out there. Than yeah, always, always. And then I'm like, you know, I'm a small business. I can't offer, you know, I can, I mean, yeah. I do, do our best and we try to be very mindful, but 
you know, it, it, when you're competing against, you know, Fortune 50 companies that have, you know, unbe unbelievable amounts of cash. Um, you know, I, I read an interesting study that We Spire came out with this week, and it was talking about, um, yes, there's massive amounts of people on the move, but they are far more likely to want to be on the move if your company has impact and purpose at its core. So given that I run a social impact co company that, that actually helped, but it, 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 it and I, you know, if I'm wondering if I can find, cause I can put it in the chat, but if not, after we hang up, I can share it with you. It might be a study you want to share yeah, with that's really interesting. Um, But the number, it was something like 57% of employees are gainfully looking, but that number drops down to 12% if they're employees that are working for a company that is making purpose like its core component and putting a value on employee engagement. So I think there's a lesson to be learned if you run a business um, that you really think about how are you engaging your employees beyond just doing the work every day to make the, you know, to fill the coffers, so to speak. So I thought that was an interesting study. It's we, W-E-S and then Spire, all one word. And they it, it just came out this past week or the week before. Well, but, I will definitely check that out. And that does make me feel better about it. And I, and I, I agree with that. I think the people, especially people who work um, for the second shift, I know there's, I like working here because I feel like I'm making an impact and the days that yes. are, the days that are hard. I mean, everybody feels like work is never been the most fun part of their lives. Um, I mean, it, it should be a fun part, but you know, that at least if you know, that you're doing something that you know has meaning and impact in, in the world or in other people's lives, it definitely gives purpose and it makes it not feel as much like work because you know that there's a bigger agenda out there. And um, I hope that our second shift employees and community and members feel the same way because that's how we feel about it. Um, well, I wanna just say thank you so much for being here, for joining us. I, I don't know if you have any last thoughts that you want to put out there, but I hope that everyone will buy uh, Susan's book. Um, we're going to put it in the newsletter and on the blog. So there's a link so you can know where to go and buy it. The Lost Art of Connecting. I really thought this was you know, as meaningful as you might have thought it was to put it out at, the, at in March of 2020. I think it's actually way more meaningful right now. So thank you. We all need it right now. Thank you, Jenny. This is amazing. I love just all you that you're doing, and I so appreciate you having me here today. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. You'll uh, we'll post this again later, like I said. So if anyone missed any part of it, and thank you for being here, Susan. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend.